Our second speaker in this session is Nick Robbins, uh, who's a doctoral candidate in history of art at, at Yale University. His research centres on 19th century art in Europe and North America, particularly on histories of science and the environment. His dissertation, which is called Oceans of Air, examines the aesthetic, scientific and cultural histories of climate in the 19th century North Atlantic world. All right. Well, um, just to echo everyone else, uh, my sincere thanks to Kate and Nika for organizing this amazing conference, and to David and the Courtauld for having us, and to everyone who has been speaking and engaging. Yes? Oh, you can't hear me. Is this better? Oh, good. Um, <clears throat> so... After seeing John Constable's painting, The Cornfield, at the 1826 Royal Academy exhibition, the critic Robert Hunt would write in The Examiner of the painting's, quote, fine, it's clear, healthful, and true complexion, neither pale, nor flushed, nor artificial. What would have moved a critic in the 1820s to treat a landscape painting like a body, and moreover one marked implicitly as white? In my talk today, I want to pose a simple question. What did landscape and paintings of, the, of English landscapes in particular have to do with race in the early 19th century? I will address this question through Constable's paintings and the spaces of exhibition in London in the early 1820s. I want to consider how, if a landscape painting was like a body, how it might then register its necessary traversal of different exhibitionary environments, which themselves acted upon those paintings. In doing so, I want to think about how Constable's landscapes might be seen to signal anxieties about the permeability and mutability of race, and whiteness in particular, in the context of imperial London. Discourses of race and the environment, <clears throat> and specifically climate, were indelibly linked in the early 19th century. And my paper proceeds from the understanding that Constable's series of large exhibition landscapes, such as the Haywain, seen here, um, painted to be shown at the Royal Academy, were preoccupied with representing England's climate, one that he would define as, quote, one of more than vernal freshness. Constable was far, far from alone in his celebration of England's climate, which had to be defended against earlier classical theories that cast this damp northern environment as a place of intellectually sluggish peoples. These negative assessments would have to be rearticulated by British writers in the 17th and 18th centuries, such that the island's atmosphere became the temperate seat of enterprise and genius. The atmosphere of England became a means of defining subjects. Take, for example, this period's insistent identification of Englishness with liberty, which was buttressed not only by recourse to racial myths of Teutonic or Saxon origins, and by what Simone Gicondi has called the negative dialectic of slavery, but also in figurations of the purity of England's terrain and air itself, or at least so claimed William Cowper, in his famous abolitionist verses, quote, slaves cannot breathe in England if their lungs receive our air that moment they are free. And so it is Constable's preoccupation with a specifically English climate that in part opens his work to broader questions of the geographies of race and identity in the Atlantic world. And yet the first decades of the 19th century also present a kind of complicated moment for understanding British theories of human variety. It can be understood as a kind of transitional moment, coming after the 18th century discourses that, as Roxanne Wheeler has persuasively shown, relied on climate as a key agent of racial difference and mutability. Um, but as Nika mentioned this morning, these, these theories begin shifting in the 1770s, but are really only consolidated in the mid-19th century with a biological race science in which the body, and especially the white body, was increasingly divorced from environmental influence. And so looking at Constable's paintings in the 1820s, my question is in part to see if they might register this confluence of prior and emergent discourses. 
This divided moment was enacted in the very spaces of London's exhibitionary cultures. And to discuss this ambivalence, I want to turn away from the Royal Academy and instead to the rooms of William Bullock's Egyptian Hall on Piccadilly. Founded in 1812 as a museum of natural history, but which uh, by 1819 was being used to stage auctions and temporary exhibitions. In 1821, Bullock had traveled to northern Scandinavia, known as Lapland, interested less in knowledge of the Sami peoples who lived there and more in his attempt to domesticate reindeer in the British Isles. And he brought back with him a reindeer herd, but also a Sami family, Jens and Karina Christian Holm, as they were known, who along with their son and their household were subsequently put on display in Egyptian Hall. Thomas Rowlandson's aquatent scene here emphasizes one notable aspect of Bullock's display, the large panoramic landscape painting of the North Cape which surrounded it. While, it can be a, while this painting can be assimilated to the broader cultures of London's spectacle, the panoramic landscape had a very specific function, or at least I believe. It served to doubly articulate the racial difference and geographical distance of the Holm family, part of what Sadia Qureshi, whom we heard from yesterday, has called Bullock's, quote, technology of display, and also central to Bullock's conception of the mutually determining relationship between the Laplanders and their landscape. Indeed, given his interest in bringing reindeer to the British Isles, Bullock's project was, it was adjacent and participating in the key colonial science of acclimatization. But a, sati a satirical print published that spring by Isaac Cruikshank imagined a different process, the return of Jens and Karina home to their, quote, native country, now attired in the fashion of Georgian London, whose strangeness is redoubled in the specimens of English culture that frame the scene. The caption identifies them now as Anglo-Laplanders, seeming to signify that in the process of their stay in London, a change to their racial identity has been effected. On the one hand, this seems to refer to the contradictions that the Sami or the Laplanders, as they were known, presented to the convoluted classifications of racial theorists who, as Nell Painter has shown, quote, stumbled continuously over whether they should be classified as white or otherwise. On the other hand, the transformation into Anglo-Laplander suggested in the vein of climatic theories of human variety, the environmental mutability of race and the arbitrary uh, the arbitrariness of the signifiers of civilization. Yet, at this very moment, Bullock's displays were to provide a foundational site for the articulation of the opposite understanding of human variety. Robert Knox, whose 1850 book, The Races of Men, contributed in large part to the ascendance of fixed biological theories of race and racism, would recall that it was on, upon a visit to Egyptian Hall in 1821 that he first conceived of race's immutable embodied fact. His encounter with the facsimiles of relief sculptures from an Egyptian tomb installed there by Giovanni Belzoni uh, Knox would later recall, impressed upon him, quote, the unalterable character of races on which clime, a time or climate seem to have had no effect. So it is this charged ambivalence between theories of race as mutable and immutable, between whiteness asserted anxiously as permeable or asserted anxiously as fixed fact, which frames my discussion of constables' paintings and their spaces of display. In turning to their intended destination at the Royal Academy, I follow Andrew Hemingway's contention that following Constable's move to London in 1817, his, quote, real field of campaign becomes the exhibition room and not the fields of Suffolk. And likewise, I follow Anne Birmingham's argument that landscape painting in this moment increasingly had to compete with forms of urban spectacle, like Egyptian Hall, and assert themselves within the crowded visual atmosphere of the Royal Academy's exhibitions in Somerset House, something that Constable's paintings notably failed to do. They had, instead, a different goal, to convey into the exhibition's urban environment 
a purified English atmosphere. The freshness and dew that, as Mark Hallett has recently shown, was the peculiar obsession of Constable in the 1820s, a quality which, as his friend John Fisher wrote to him in 1821, was difficult to see in, quote, the crowded copal atmosphere of the exhibition. It is important to try here to perceive the space of the exhibition itself as a kind of climate. Writing of Somerset House's galleries in 1820, another critic described the, quote, glare and heat of the rooms, compounded by what William Hazlitt that same year would describe as, quote, the merciless splendor of the painter's palette that puts nature out of countenance in the wide, dazzling waste of color. The space of London exhibitions in the 1820s was then a different kind of artificial environment from Bullock's, one which was seen to threaten the integrity of the paintings within. In at least one vision of the Royal Academy exhibition made in 1821 for Pierce Egan's wildly popular life in London, the heterogeneous spectacle of paintings and connoisseurs is, fig is figured along racial lines. Among the light-skinned visitors, all of whom are shown blushing to designate their whiteness, we see two, fig two figures who are differently racially articulated, a dark-skinned man in a top coat facing another man with a long beard and pointed hat, marking him as perhaps Persian in there on the left. As Ian Baucom has argued, Englishness was constantly defined against empire through a, quote, spatial theory of collective identity rooted in particular places. And in the early 19th century, <clears throat> this othered space and environment would, increase, would increasingly be embodied by London itself, and not least by Constable, who had a notably phobic relationship to the city. He consciously positioned the freshness and beauty of his paintings against what he conceived of as the artificial atmosphere of London, its exhibition halls, and the paintings produced to satisfy its demands, an aim which he would frequently express in languages of purity and pathology. Constable's aversion to the aesthetic disorder of London could be assimilated to his class politics, but as Zari Makdizi has argued, the early 19th century also saw an internal colonization of the city and a concomitant orientalization and racialization of its working classes and other marginal populations, a process by which the westernness and whiteness of the English was made legible, not only against colonial subjects, but against internal and policed forms of difference. In this sense, Constable's oft-discussed proposition, quote, should not subjects purely English be made the vehicle of general landscape, takes on a different inflection, such as a process by which Englishness, purely English subjects, is produced not as specific <clears throat> but instead as a sign of a general or a normal visual and material idiom that displaces alternate formulations. Back to Constable. But in order to make this claim, Constable had first to ensure that a painting such as the Haywain was able to traverse across climatic difference, that the material instantiation of Suffolk, of England, could be transposed and exhibited without becoming marked by what he considered the unnatural heterogeneity of the metropolitan climate. Such anxieties about mutability can be seen in the very structure of his paintings. Here we can turn to his most consistent statement about the aim of his art, which was to capture the, quote, chiaroscuro of nature, to prove that this ordered relation of light and dark, quote, really does exist in nature rather than being just the province of pictures. In doing so, Constable imagined an internal and self-enclosing pictorial structure that was perfectly transparent to the organization of nature itself, one in which, as uh, Fuseli wrote in his lecture on the subject, quote, every object has what share of light it can obtain by place and position. 
we can see chiaroscuro then as a kind of social natural form, which was coordinated not to the artificial space of exhibition, but rather to the stuff of nature itself. Such was an aim rather different from JMW's J.M.W. Turner's practice of calibrating his paintings to the space of their display. Instead, Constable imagined a means of creating an internal order, a unified and autonomous thing that might be able to survive its crossings over different exhibitionary climates. Here I want to understand such an aim's resonance with the widespread discourse about degeneration that suffused med medical discourses about the effects of colonial or extreme climates upon the colonizer's white body. The defense of bodily integrity being, as Sadia Hartman shows, um, central to the articulation of whiteness in this period. See, for example, a medical notice in the London Magazine, published in 1820, which argued that humans were only able to, quote, live in all latitudes because man, quote, makes his own climate wherever he goes. This is how we might understand the Haywain, as uh, Jill and Darcy Wood describes it, as an artificial reality system meant to sustain the sensation of Englishness within the heterogeneous spaces of imperial London. Constable's anxiety over the stability of his landscape self-containment can be clarified by considering the changes that he made to the Haywain between its showings at Somerset House in 1821 and the British institution the next winter. And as Kate mentioned, they accepted exhibits that had been seen before. And since he didn't find a buyer, he put it on show again. While ascertaining precisely such cha the changes that he made is pretty much impossible. From accounts, it seems that in the interim, he intensified the scattered depositions of pure white paint across the painting surface. The signature of his seemingly transparent, spontaneous, and fresh naturalism that commenced with the Haywain and that would only intensify over the 1820s. Robert Hunt wrote after its exhibition at the British, in British Institution that he, quote, doubted whether Mr. Constable has improved the painting by putting out certain catching lights, refractions of the sun's rays, etc. Constable's effort to secure at the painting's surface this unmediated material sign of suffix freshness and dews was insistently seen as instead working against his naturalism, just as Turner's paintings would be diagnosed with yellow fever. We might instead see Constable's snow, as we know it, this pure white paint, as a kind of exaggerated covering for the deeper chiaroscuro of his artificial climates, a surface that could insulate the work from the soot and slime, as he called it, of the metropolis. This insulation was not metaphorical. As Sarah Cove has, has shown in her study of Constable's paintings, he consciously intensified the white brightness of his paintings since he believed that they would be altered over time by impure or sulfuretted metropolitan air. Thus, this deposition of white pigment here, a color detached from any form of epidermal signification, becomes a kind of protective enclosure for the painted sign of English purity. To conclude, though, I want to return to Bullock's Egyptian Hall and to a painting shown the year before Constable painted his Haywain, one that projects an opposite understanding of the relations of body and environment. Theodore Jericho's Raft of the Medusa, as we know, caused a sensation in London, seen by at least 40,000 visitors, including, I suspect, Constable himself. While celebrated by many, critics in London faulted Jericho for the same shortcomings as had the critics in Paris the year before. That, quote, the clothes, the flesh, are all the same color. While the critic for the repository of the arts found its colorism to be, quote, cold, hard, and repulsive, its shadows constrained. <coughs> What went unspoken in these criticisms, of course, was that it failed to sufficiently differentiate its raced figures, converting them instead into a transmuted tangle of bodies beset by climatic fevers. 
<coughs> it was also then a failure of chiaroscuro, which made the painting to some dangerously illegible. This racial instability was redoubled in the immersive spatial dislocations that Jonathan Crary has examined, which left the viewer of metropolitan spectacle, quote, drifting on an amorphous surface like the sea, without markers, without a center, and in which homogeneity and repetition overwhelm singularity. That is to say that the painting opened the viewer's body upon an undefined space that lacked the sense of locatedness and enclosure to which Constable aspired and which Baucom argues was key to the construction of Englishness. This racial and spatial instability of Jericho's canvas forcefully articulated the profound deracination of the body and its violent dislocations in the colonial Atlantic. Yet the conspicuous failure of any contemporary critics to note the dark-skinned figure at the painting's heroic apex remains its own problem, a figure that even as he strains to be seen, to be located, remained impossible to register. Like Jericho's bodies, Constable's figures too had the tendency to disappear completely from contemporary critical responses to his work though for opposite reasons, of course. Set into this calibrated system of light and dark, the white English bodies of Constable's exhibition landscapes were so at home in the world constructed for them that they merged within the enclosed complexion of nature his paintings presented. Take the figure of the boy on the hay cart, reaching outwards to hail his dog, who looks, or which looks back on him from the riverbank, a moment of mutual communication which seems to suggest a natural language, a world that responds to and confirms one's belonging, which is to say the opposite of the black figure on Jericho's raft, hailing the boat at the painting's horizon which does not register his presence. We might then see Constable's boy as a kind of inverted echo of Jericho's straining figure, and then we might also see how Constable's paintings constructed a world for this English boy on his own slightly tilted raft cart, reaching forward to secure recognition and emplacement from the landscape that surrounds him. It was just such a dream that we might see as Constable's whiteness in a London of upheaval and empire, that dream of a passage across space which left both, both environment and the white body that it enclosed unmarked, unchanged, and unchallenged. Thank you.